You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not and, as um, simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. Well, I cannot even believe it, but we started something and finished it. It's amazing. It's amazing. Usually when I do this, I'm like, I, I want to go over the wide receivers and then, you know what, it'd be interesting to kind of go through the entire team. And after, like, the second episode, it's like, I can't do this anymore. It's so boring. Hopefully that's not exactly how you felt. And I know, look, some of these were more interesting than others. There's no doubt about it, right? Do you even remember who Cameron McDonald is and what role he plays? I don't. I mean, I, I, I can see on the thing what position he is. But what school did he go to? Anything about his college career? Prior NFL experience, again, I know because I'm looking at it and I can see that it's green, which means he's an undrafted free agent and all that, but but I still think it it is and was a uh, a good thing to do and a worthwhile thing. Um, as I said, for those that don't know, we're going to be talking about the safeties today. Um, purpose being, as I said, just a better overall understanding of the roster as a whole. There's a lot of guys like David Bakhtiari we feel like we really don't need to talk about, but I think we do, especially, you know, and this doesn't apply to David Bakhtiari. I'm not saying it does, but I think a lot of times you get a guy like Bakhtiari or maybe, you know, Adrian Amos, although I think we fully understand he had a bad year, but sometimes guys start to deteriorate and we continue to call them top whatever guys. Again, that doesn't apply to Bakhtiari. As far as I can tell, he's still a a very, very good tackle, top 10-ish. Maybe top five? I don't know. We'll see if we can get him for a full season this year. Kenny might be a better example. Although, again, I think we're starting to, as a fan base, understand the situation, even though we maybe don't fully understand how dire it is or maybe how bleak it's been and for how long. But anyways, going over old guys, new guys, young guys, first-round picks, undrafted free agents, just top to bottom, just to try to get a better understanding. Um, the 53 conversation wasn't as in-depth as I kind of initially saw it. That kind of happened for two reasons. Number one, this takes a very long time, and by the time it's like, all right, let's do a full in-depth 53, it's like, no, dude, we, we, we're at like an hour here. And number two is for a lot of these, it, it really wasn't as um, necessary. You know, I mean, it, when, when I looked at all the different things I kind of wanted to look at, it's like, you don't need to. They're going to keep four, and you know who the four are. You know what I mean? So we can maybe kind of rehash, not the whole experiment, but specifically the 53, a little bit more in depth. But I I, I need to at least get some more information from training camp. So until training camp starts, I guess that's not entirely true. I could do a preliminary 53. But until training camp starts, we really can't do anything super in depth. And then when we start actually identifying some of the, uh, you know, whenever you look at it, sometimes it gets tough. And I don't generally do a very good job in terms of the 53 projection. I mean, we all do from a standpoint of knowing most of the team. But, you know, as far as identifying which of these kind of on-the-bubble guys stay and go, that's when you can really start to look into what is the, the history of the Green Bay Packers. Things like, you know, what is the precedent for a guy that you believe is slightly better? You know, for, let's just say, for example, Tyler Goodson or Lou Nichols or even Patrick Taylor. Right? I think I think the team likes Patrick Taylor and whatnot, but he's also been here since 2020. 
Tyler Goodson's only been here since 2022, and Lou Nichols is a, undra- is a seventh-round pick this year. So you've got kind of the sliding scale, where on one hand, you have more trust and reliance, and, and potentially even you like them a little bit more as a player. And on the other hand, you're looking at upside. These are younger, more moldable guys with maybe more upside. And the only reason I say more upside is because a guy like Patrick Taylor maybe has kind of hit his ceiling, and we see what it is now, and it's a question of, are we okay with that? And we want that type of, like, Patrick Taylor is exactly what we're looking for in a number three, and so he stays? Or do we say, you know what, let's let's try to mold Goodson a little bit and, and Nichols, and let's roll with that and see? So those are the kinds of things that I'm talking about in terms of precedent. Do they lean more toward what they know positionally, what, what, what do they tend to do? You know, wide receiver, although it's a very unique situation, it'd still be interesting. You know, you've got, for example, Samore Ture or Dontavian Wicks. I don't, I'm not, as you know, not as high on Samore Ture as a lot of the fan base. I, I think he has a relatively low ceiling, but he's got experience. He's been on the field. The team can trust him. Do you take that or Dontavian Wicks, who is a fifth round pick with a higher ceiling, but has less experience and more more uh, growth and understanding is needed? So that's when that'll become more interesting. But until we get a little bit of data in terms of how guys are doing, eh. And that's a massive undertaking because if you really wanted to do it right, you'd have to go back, for example, to 2019 and get an understanding of how these guys were doing. So essentially trying to find comparable situations because, you know, fifth round picks are not all created equal. But cross that bridge when we come to it. All right. So today we're looking at safety. Darnell Savage, Rudy Ford, Tervarius Moore, Jonathan Owens, Anthony Johnson, Dallin Levitt, Benny Sapp, and Innis Gaines are on the docket. Again, any questions or controversies? Controversies. Just let me be fancy once in a while, all right? Jeez. But I, any thought in terms of, well, I think they're going to play him here, or they might move him here, it doesn't matter. We're just trying to get through the roster, and so this is where they're currently sitting. This is how we're going to discuss them. But all right, let's uh, get started with Mr. Darnell Savage. I think I've been kind of uh, descriptive of Darnell maybe more so than a lot of other players just because again I'm, I'm kind of on a different wavelength than a lot of other Packer fans when it comes to him and, and maybe in a way that doesn't matter what I've constantly been trying to say is I don't necessarily know that he's a bad player I think he's been ruined by uh, the whether it's the scheme of Joe Barry or the complexity of the scheme I don't exactly know what it is and this isn't a definitive thing but it looks somewhat clear to me that that's the case. But again, it kind of doesn't matter as long as he can't acclimate himself into the defense that we have, and we're not going to change the defense, and I guess it doesn't matter. But it still matters to me insofar as I, I, I'm, I'm not on the bandwagon of that was just, you know, he, he's just a garbage player. Maybe he is, I don't know. But just to do a quick recap of what it is that I've been saying, Darnell Savage didn't actually have that big of or, or that bad of a rookie year. In fact, if you look at it from a coverage standpoint, he was quite good. And realistically, that's all we ever really expected the guy to be. He's a blazing fast sideline to sideline guy. Now, it, it's not necessarily excusable. You you need to be able to make tackles and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, the only thing that matters, the only thing that anybody really cares about, is how good of a coverage safety are you. So if we go back and look at 2019 Darnell Savage, um, I, I think he had a pretty good year, and I think the fan base generally thought he was uh, had a decent year. I think maybe we came in with too high of expectations because the hype train was so unbelievably high. And also we had Adrian Amos, who was a you know top 20 safety in the league, and so it kind of caused a little bit of spoiling there. But he had a 65 overall grade, which is not terrible. That put him at number 52 overall. Again, not not getting anybody that excited, but it makes him a number two safety. On average, teams have one safety in the top 32, which leaves room for one safety in the top 64. We had one of each. As a rookie, he was the sixth highest graded, but everybody was pretty close. The lowest graded was Roderick Teamer, who had a 54 grade. Juan Thornhill had a 71 grade. So he was right in the middle, but everybody was kind of sandwiched in there. However... Again, if you just look at coverage, Darnell Savage jumped all the way up to 24th. In fact, Adrian Amos was 23rd and Savage was 24th. We had two top 25 safeties and one of them was rookie Darnell Savage. The reason his grade was as low as it was is he had a 37 run defense grade. That's, that, that was the thing, but as far as coverage goes, he was right up there. 
He only allowed 197 yards. He did give up three touchdowns, but had two interceptions and two pass breakups. He was the second highest graded rookie um, in terms of coverage behind only Juan Thornhill, and it was quite close. It was 78 compared to 76.3, and then it dropped all the way down to 70 and then 68, so it started to cascade pretty far from there. There were really only two guys that had pretty solid coverage grades, and that was Juan Thornhill and Darnell Savage. Then 2020 rolls around, and um, Savage ended up taking a step. He was graded as the 17th uh, highest graded safety in the entire NFL, with a 72 overall grade. He had a 74 coverage grade, an 85 pass rush grade, and his run defense came up to a 63. So we had Adrian Amos, who was ranked number two, and Darnell Savage, who was ranked number 17. To make things even more intriguing, Darnell Savage didn't really even have his first good game. And remember, this happened with Amos, too. Both of them got off to a really slow start and didn't pick it up until week 11. If you look at from week 11 through the end of the season, Adrian Amos was the third highest graded safety. Darnell Savage was the fifth highest graded safety in the entire NFL. And actually, if we go back one more week and look at weeks 10 through 18, Amos was number two, number one, Darnell Savage was number two. We had the two highest graded safeties in the second half of 2020. Adrian Amos had a 92 coverage grade. Darnell Savage had an 86.3. He had, um, let's see, he gave up 133 yards, zero touchdowns, had four interceptions and six pass breakups. He was tied for number one in the NFL in interceptions the second half of that season with Tyron Matthew. Only six safeties had more than two. Only 15 had more than one. So he had a good rookie year. Then he got off to a kind of a slow start the second year, but finished as one of the strongest safeties in the entire NFL. Then we fired our defensive coordinator, right? So understand, what is it he's getting better at? It's not necessarily just playing safety. He got really, really good at being a Mike Pettin safety. So then 2021 rolls around. He goes from a 72 grade down to a 57. That was worse than what he was as a rookie. He only graded in the 70s twice, weeks 9 and 10. That's it. He had two 69 grades, but for, from a strict 70 st standpoint, he only had two good games the entire season, and his coverage grade went down to a 60. His rookie and sophomore year were both in the mid-70s. He dropped down to a 60 in terms of his coverage. He gave up 191, uh, excuse me, 409 yards, which is about as, well, it's more than he gave up in both of the other years. Um, he gave up six touchdowns. He only gave up four his prior two seasons. He had two interceptions and seven pass breakups, 116.6 NFL passer rating. The year before was a 63. So he got a lot worse. But what did we say? Look, it's a tough situation for safeties. He's going to come into year two, uh, you know, with the uh, Joe Barry system. And so hopefully he can kind of pick it up. Nope, it got even worse. He went down to a 47 overall grade. 56 run defense, 41 tackling, and a 43 coverage grade. Again, this guy came in as a rookie and was a, what, top 20 coverage safety in the NFL. Now his fourth year in the system, he had a 45 or a 44 coverage grade. That doesn't make sense to me. At least insofar as just saying, oh yeah, he's just terrible now. Hmm, I don't know. He only had one game this past year where he graded out in the 70s, and it was a 74 only. That was against Washington. And uh, he had one game where he graded out in the 70s in coverage. That was week six against the Jets. That's it. And as far as is there any signs or proof that he got better as the season went on? No. I mean, he, he, he went out after week 12. Well, I guess week 11. He played one snap week 12, one snap week 15. Then he came back and finished the season. And he had a 68, 52, and 56 grade. His coverage grades were 64, 56, and 50. That's not good. Now, you can, you can grab his first three games and compare and say, well, it's better than that if you want to because he had a horrible game week one against Minnesota. But the point is, he didn't have this big breakout suddenly, oh, man, he looked really good. There's nothing here. Now, there's been a lot of talk about Savage in terms of trying to do too much and trying to this and that, and he's made some changes mentally and trying to understand how to do things. And obviously, Joe Barry and Matt LaFleur and all these guys are trying to work with him, trying to get to figure out what the problem is. And, and maybe they will and maybe they won't. I don't know. I don't have a massive amount of hope. But he's going into year five, and I don't think anybody doubts this is make or break. Either he's going to figure out how to play in a Joe Barry system, or he's going to be gone. And you know what really sucks? If the defense is bad, and Savage is bad with it, both of these guys are going to be gone. And there's a chance that we could bring somebody in that could actually use Darnell Savage. But it isn't going to matter, because we're not going to pay the guy to stick around and find out. Or we will, and the fan base is going to burn Green Bay to the ground. 
but I just find it to be unfortunate. Um, I, I, whatever we were doing with Petten, obviously it wasn't necessarily working. But man, this this fire our defensive coordinator thing just seems to be getting worse every single time. I'm starting to think if you go in reverse, we had better defensive coordinators. Joe Barry's been the worst. Petten was better than Joe Barry. And I'm standing by my uh, Dom Capers is a better... Maybe we just go get Dom. He's still out there somewhere. Wasn't he in Minnesota for a while? He's not that far. Give him a call. Because Dom Capers had terrible talent to work with. He had nothing to work with. When we went and loaded up and got all these pieces and, and kind of had a bit of a breakout defensive performance with Mike Petten, that's largely because of the amount of players we... I mean, that, that was that was after Dom was gone. I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm half joking with the Dom Capers thing, but... It's the other reason why the whole fire Joe Barry thing is, like, I, I understand where you're coming from, but I don't know what the solution is. Because the scheme is not the problem. People are running this scheme all over the NFL and succeeding. So what are we going to do? Find somebody else. Find who? Because everything that everybody wants, basically you're describing Mike Pettin, right? Mike Pettin, there, there was no better candidate than Mike Pettin. The guy has never been anything other than an elite um, defensive coordinator. Right, what was he, like top 10 DVOA defense every single year he's ever been a defensive coordinator? He had the attitude, he had the look, he had all that. Didn't do anything. Didn't matter. So I don't want to fire Joe Barry. I want this to start working. That's what I want. Because if, if this doesn't work, then we will fire Joe Barry, and that's the right thing to do. But you know what we're going to do? We're going to hire another defensive coordinator. He's going to come in. We're going to get excited. The problem is, None of these guys have ever worked with them. It's going to be a new scheme all over again, probably, maybe, I don't know. If not, what's the point? So none of our guys are going to be acclimated to it, so we're going to have another bad year. So there goes 2024, and then we're going to say, well, maybe 2025, year two of the system, year two of the system. How many freaking times do we have to say that? And then when it doesn't get better, then we start talking about firing him, and then he's going to get another chance. It's just the same crap over and over again. You know what? Just freaking let's go. Yeah, we got all this talent, and we're going to waste it if we spend three, four years overhauling our defense every three, four years. So I want Joe Barry to freaking figure it out. We ended the season strong. Good. Pick it up exactly where you left off. I'm talking week one. Not week five. Not week nine. Week one. And I want Savage to be a part of it. Don't know what the problem is. Figure it out. Savage, figure it out, dude. Joe Barry's asking you to do what other safeties around the league are thriving, who don't have the athleticism that you have. Learn it. Do it. Let's go. Come on. It's freaking embarrassing the amount of investment we've had in defense and the lack of production we've gotten out of it. And for no reason. Savage is a good safety. There's no reason for this level of crap. All right, let's flip to the other side of the dynamic, and that's Rudy Ford. That's, uh, th th that is, if, if Darnell Savage gets too much fan ire, I think uh, Rudy Ford maybe gets too much fan love. I'm excited. I, I like that Rudy Ford um, was able to step in. And it wasn't a disaster. And uh, maybe he can actually be a guy that can step in and, and be awesome. I don't really know. But I, I do have my reservations. Um, first of all, if we just look at it in a big picture sense, it looks like we got another absolute steal. Another another uh, Brian Gutekunst master class here, right? His grades over the years with Arizona, 60 and then 42. Then he goes to Philly at 67-52. Then he goes to Jacksonville last year and is a 57. Then he comes to Green Bay, 74 overall grade and a 78 coverage grade. His highest before that was a 62. So by far his best season. Here is sort of my reservation with all this. His grade is not necessarily because of sustained success. He primarily played weeks 10 through weeks 18. Here are three grades in that span. He had a 90 grade against Dallas, a 90, almost 90 grade against Philadelphia, and an 83 grade against Minnesota, which is ridiculously awesome. Do you know what the rest of the grades were? 33, 48, 38, 54, 53. So here's what we got from Rudy Ford from week 10 on when he kind of took over. 90, 33. 90, 48, 38, 54, 83, 53. It was like two of the worst possible performances you've ever seen in your life, and then like the number one safety in football, and then a horrific performance, and then number one safety in football, and then garbage and garbage, and then, the, you know what I mean? As wildly inconsistent as you can possibly get. Couple other problems. Number one, two of these games in which he had elite grades came largely because of interceptions. Against Dallas, he had two interceptions. He also had an interception against Minnesota. I'm not saying that's the entire thing, but that's a part of it. 
And against Minnesota, he also gave up 118.8 passer rating, which is really not very good at all. And then if you look at his run defense grades in that span, it was 60, 45, 69, 30, 49, 61, 60, 64. So he never really graded out well as a run defender. He was usually bad as a coverage guy, aside from three games where he graded out of his freaking mind. If you don't have these, I don't necessarily want to call them fluky because, I mean, it's, it's three games in a, what, three, six, eight game stretch. It's a, it's a pretty big number. He also played a significant snaps week four, just kind of randomly, and he had a, a 79 grade, which is great. But if you remove these sort of games that you don't really expect him to have on a regular basis, he goes down to being one of the worst safeties in football. And in fact, he has basically the same grades he's had with all these other teams, 40s and 50s. So, again, I, I like Rudy Ford. And I'm glad that overall it kind of balanced out into a, a good grade. And he obviously made some plays. I mean, the guy had three picks in, in his half a season that he played, which is cool. Two of them came in one game, which, you know, makes it memorable. You know, you, you're a fan base that doesn't really have a good safety, and you're upset about it, and then this guy comes in out of nowhere, and he gets two picks against Dallas, and of course we all hate Dallas, and that was an unbelievable game, so it just gets burned into our memory, and Rudy Ford is our savior. He saved our safety group, he saved our team, he saved our franchise, he's, he's unbelievable. But he's, you know, a 29-year-old sixth-round pick that has never really been good and had three elite games for the Green Bay Packers. I just don't know that this is a long-term slam dunk. I think he's going to be the starter this year. And again, I like him. I like that he's a, a special teams guy. And in other words, he comes downhill and just lights people up. I'm excited to watch him. But, you know, I, I expect him to regress this year, at least in terms of if you look at his grade. I don't know that he gets three interceptions in a half a season. In other words, are we expecting him to get six picks this year if he plays all year? No, he's not going to do that. So it's weird because I'm 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 also kind of a Rudy Ford fanboy, but at the same time I'm looking at it and just saying, I just don't think it's going to be that again. You know, it it just it just has regression kind of written all over it. All right, next up, why don't we look at Tarvarius Moore? He is the uh, Green Bay Packer that um, I feel like I know the least about as far as guys that I should know about. You know, I don't know why. It's like every time I see him, I'm like, who is I don't. I know I should know you, but I don't know you. Anyways, let's get to know him. Six foot two, two hundred pound, twenty eighteen third round pick by the San Francisco 49ers. Just a shade under twenty seven years old. Spent four years in San Francisco. Played sort of a, I guess you call it like a safety three role in terms of his snap counts. Um, his grades over four years: fifty two, and then sixty four, sixty, sixty four. So pretty consistently average. Uh, run defense is his biggest attribute. Pretty much been 70s over the last three years. Coverage, 62, 56, 60, so kind of in the 60 range. So we'll call it 70 run defense, 60 coverage. His tackling is all over the place. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's real good, sometimes it's terrible, so I don't know. But yeah, he spent four years in San Francisco. He's definitely moved around quite a bit. Um, in 2018, which was his first year, it was also his lowest graded year, so this could probably could tell you something, but he actually started off as a corner primarily. Um vast majority of his snaps came at outside corner. The next year, he was primarily a free safety. 165 snaps at free safety, 42 inside the box, and 24 in the slot. Only played one snap at corner, so they basically just said, you're not doing that ever again. For the next three years, he primarily stayed at free safety, but still somewhat significant snaps inside the box, which most safeties do, as well as inside the slot, uh, in the slot position. 2020 was when he played the most snaps, 324 at free safety, 119 inside the box, 88 coming at the slot position, and probably a pretty similar ratio in 2020, although he didn't play all that much. Played about a half a season, including the playoffs, and had about 60 snaps. As far as the ever-important um, special teams situation, he had a really solid rookie campaign on special teams, not too much after that. He's not a return guy, or at least hasn't been. He has played a good amount of snaps there, though. Um, in total, about 1,200 snaps over four years on special teams, so he does add that dynamic. He's never, I shouldn't say never, he's usually not terrible at it. So, I mean, it, it's pretty vanilla here with Tervarius Moore. I mean, he's a third-round pick, so obviously there's some ability, but he's been pretty steady at the average for uh, four years, and I, and I think it has to do with a couple different things. Number one, he plays in San Francisco, which, you know, obviously they know how to do defense over there. But I think beyond that, it's just looking at what we have and saying we need we need more. 
and, and especially in the experience department. So a guy that is not terrible and has been that for four years and has special teams experience, I think is just a solid, cheap option to bring in. And that's essentially what he is. Um, and considering this, the um, situation that we're in, I, I you know, you look at the top four guys, top five guys, and I don't know that we're not looking at a potential starter. I genuinely believe Savage is going to be a starter, but I don't know that he's going to end that way. I mean, he got pulled last year. He can get pulled again this year. So you look at Savage, you look at Rudy Ford, you look at Tervarius Moore, you look at Jonathan Owens, you look at Anthony Johnson, the seventh-round pick that we got this year. Um, even even Ennis Gaines, if he can make, you know, he's got experience. Dallin Levitt. I, 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 I don't know that I've ever seen anything more wide open in terms of there being a smaller gap between your number one safety and sort of your even five or six sixth guy down the list. But anyways, I think that's what Tavarius Moore is doing here. And speaking of Jonathan Owens, which I think is a very similar situation, right? We need a veteran. We need a guy that's been around. We need a guy that can, you know, come in in a pinch and at least set some kind of a floor for us. And I think that's kind of what we're dealing with here. He's 28 years old. He was a 2018 undrafted free agent for the Arizona Cardinals. And of course, he has a wife who was famous. Might as well mention that. Um... He didn't play. Let's let's go back. Eh, that's not. Who cares? So again, he, he got picked up in 2018. He didn't really play until 2020. By this point, he was with the Houston Texans. Houston Texans put him in for 10 snaps, so it's pretty insignificant. 2021, he plays 168 snaps, a little bit more significant. Grades out fairly well, but it's kind of similar to, to, to uh, Rudy Ford in that it's pretty skewed by one game. So he played in five games. One of them was a 91 grade. He ended up with a 73 overall. His other games, though, were 60, 30, 30, 60. So bad. In those games, he was targeted three times, gave up two receptions for 40 yards, and had a pick. So there's his 91 grade. And then in 2022 is the first time he actually got legitimate opportunities. He played 970 snaps, played the entire season. Unfortunately, that entire season kind of proved exactly my point, and that is... It was kind of a fluke. He didn't have any games in the 90s. He didn't have any games in the 80s. It was um, a couple in the 70s, but just ripping through real fast, kind of rounding 70, 50, 60, 70, 60, 50, 30, 40, 40, 40, 50, 50, 30, 70, 50, 50, 50. All right, so bad. And there was a really, really bad stretch there from week 8 to week 14, 30, 40, 40, 50, 50, 30. But um, on the season, gave up 23 receptions on 36 targets, 360 yards. Uh, his longest given up was 50 yards. He gave up three touchdowns, had no interceptions, three pass breakups, 124.8 passer rating when targeted. So again, I, I find these two guys to be very similar. They have experience. One, one of them was a third-round pick, one's undrafted free agent, so there's maybe a slightly higher upside there. But generally speaking, now that we are at the point we're at, kind of just looking for looking at it for what it is you've got two experienced guys that um can come in in a pinch but you know that they're not a long-term solution shouldn't say no things happen people come here and, and break out it's entirely possible that either of these two guys could be that kind of a, a candidate but just going based off the information that we have there's not a lot of upside here it just sets sort of a a floor, a low floor, but it sets a floor for us. Special teams, very similar to Tervarius Moore, pretty average. Didn't play as much, but has 251 snaps of special teams experience. So, I mean, if I had to pick, Tervarius Moore is the better candidate. He has more experience. He's more consistent, more special teams experience. I think he's a just a better player, best better special teamer across the board. But, again, we've had guys come here that are not very good and end up just tearing up the league. So this will be a wait and see thing, just like everything else, but nothing on its face to get super, super excited about. But anyways, why don't we take a quick break right here? Patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy is where you can support the podcast. If and you choose, uh, please remember to check out the pinned tweet at the top of my tweeter. That is, unless your uh, rate limit is (laughs) blocked or whatever. That like, (laughs) that just happened today. And I swear, everybody's still just talking about it all day long. That's it's like, aren't you blocked? Don't you have a rate limit? Like, what are you doing? Go away. We all know. But if you can find it, it's pinned to the top. If you can't, go to the Packernet Podcast Facebook group. Again, we as a uh, Packernet community are supporting 
a uh, particular GoFundMe for a Packernet listener, a Packers fan, and his family and the tragedy that they're going through. If you're able, please, uh, anything you can give would be greatly appreciated. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, price Priceline. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you're here in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not as simple as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened up so many more doors. The show is called The The Deal. Deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. All right, why don't we kick it off with uh, Dallin Levitt and then Innis Gaines, and we'll save the two new additions for last. Um, Dallin Levitt. I think we all came to understand that he was a big addition that came straight over from the Raiders as an addition to our special teams unit. I don't think too much has really changed about that. He spent a lot of time with Rich Bisaccia, core special teamer. He never really graded out all that well as a special teamer, which kind of comes down to a couple different things. Number one is the difference between Rich Bisaccia and teams' understandings of what they want or need in a special teamer and PFF grades. Because I honestly don't even know how you go about grading something like special teams, but whatever. But he he is a career special teams guy. His grades for Las Vegas, 55, 39, 55, 62, and then he came here to Green Bay and had a 54 PFF grade. The production, though, is fantastic. A lot of these guys, you know, they'll have pretty good grades, but there's nothing really there in terms of, like, tackles or anything. He's kind of a tackle machine. He had seven tackles, five assists, and only one miss. Those are pretty solid numbers. And again, I think it's a mentality thing. He, he's one of those guys that's just wired a certain kind of way where he's not afraid to get hurt, and he's certainly not afraid to hurt somebody. And I think we've added a lot of those types of guys, including guys like Rudy Ford, I think all have that kind of mentality, and I think that's really helped to bolster our special teams for sure. And so, you know, I'm, I'm trusting in Rich Passaccia and these guys and, and, and essentially their assessment that PFF has nothing to do with with their assessment of things and our improvement on special teams has to do with guys like Dallin Levitt. Now, he did great out where well fairly well for most of the season. He kind of just had a, a down spell which could have contributed to his overall grade. His final four or five games he didn't grade out super well and his first two were not super good, but for 60, 70 percent call it sixty percent of the season, right smack dab in the middle, he was quite solid. As far as his abilities on defense, um He hasn't done a ton. So again, it was four years in Las Vegas, but his first three years accounted for just over 100 snaps total. His grades were rated about 60. The only time he had any kind of significant snaps whatsoever was in 2021. He had 255 total snaps, 228 come in coverage, and he still had about a 62 grade. His tackling is terrible, which again is so weird for a guy that is a core special teamer. But that was the one area where he struggled. Everything else is just 60s across the board. But again... You know, Aaron Rodgers had made some kind of a comment last year about certain people understand what their role is and how beneficial it is to have guys who come in here as professionals. And he, he was referring to, I don't know if he said it explicitly or if, or not, but he was referring to special teamers, right? It's, it's probably a big blow for some people to realize that I'm never going to get over a hump. Special teams is usually seen as a stepping stone. So I think for some people, when they don't actually take that step from special teams on to something else, they get discouraged. But other people see it as, this is my career, this is what gives me value, this is what's going to help me provide for my family, and I'm going to be freaking awesome at this. 
and they're career special teams mercenaries. And I think that's Dallin Levitt. So I, I, I don't know for sure, but I would be a little bit surprised if he didn't end up making the team because of our commitment and investment in special teams and, and him being sort of a leader. I remember there was some, what a, some comments about, I think Rodgers, again, was talking about it, but you know, there, there's generally only certain people that speak in the locker room, and Dallin Levitt wouldn't be one of those guys, but he actually did speak up at one point. And so I think at least in terms of special teams, he's seen as a leader, if not just for the team in general. I think he asserts himself in that kind of a way. So I don't really see him going anywhere. He will be a backup safety for the sole express purpose of being a special teamer. And finally, we get Ennis Gaines. Ennis Gaines was picked up in 2021 as an undrafted free agent. Uh, that season, we only saw him in the preseason. We saw him through all three games in the preseason. Graded out kind of average, I guess. 67, 40, 72 were his grades. So two good games and a bad game. But that was about it. We didn't really have a ton to go on. He's six foot two, 207, came out of TCU. In that preseason, he gave up 41 yards and a touchdown, but also had a pass breakup, 125.6 coverage grade, which of course is not fantastic. Tackling was horrific. He had um, nine tackles, two assists, and four missed tackles, which is a 26.7 missed tackle rate. Uh, when 2022 wrapped around, he actually didn't play in the preseason, but d- did get a couple snaps in the regular season, especially down the stretch. Week 16, he had 13 snaps, 59 grade. Week 17 against Minnesota, and he was playing in the slot, by the way. Um, 18 snaps, 60 grade. Week 18 against Detroit, 13 snaps, 37 PFF grade. Never really graded out very well in coverage or run defense, but did have a couple decent games as far as tackling, but overall 34 grade. It was pretty terrible. So his only regular season action, he had a 49 PFF grade overall, 51 run defense, 34 tackling, 51 coverage. Um, In his very limited action, he was targeted five times. Four of them were caught for 28 yards. And so Ennis Gaines is a guy that absolutely needs to assert himself on special teams if he's going to have a, really a chance. I mean, I know he does have some experience, but when you look at, you know, we, for example, we have Benny Sapp. We haven't talked about him yet, but he's also an undrafted free agent, and he hasn't proven anything yet, not in a positive way, but also not in a negative way, whereas Innis Gaines has been here for the last two years and has kind of demonstrated that he's just not really able to do much. So if you had to choose between Innis Gaines and Benny Sapp, depending on how terrible Benny Sapp looks in his limited opportunities, I feel like you go with a guy like Benny because who knows? But on top of that, he doesn't have what Dallin Lovett has on special teams. He doesn't have the experience of Traverius Moore and Jonathan Owens, nor does he set as high of a floor. Clearly not as excited about him as they are with Anthony Johnson, the rookie. And of course, he can't compete with Rudy Ford, Darnell Savage. So in my mind, Innis Gaines is kind of bottom of the list. However, this is year three. This is, in my opinion, his last opportunity to demonstrate that he can provide something, whether that's special teams or as a safety or anything, but it, it has to be legit. Like real, serious, legitimate growth from Innis Gaines where the coaches can see, holy crap, he really gets this now. Because I don't think if he doesn't provide that, I really don't see him on the team this year. Could be way off, but I just don't see it. But all right, let's get to the safety, Anthony Johnson Jr. Make sure you put in the junior if you want to look him up because there was another Anthony Johnson in this draft class. Dane Brugler had him as the number 17 safety in this class, which is good enough for a fifth or sixth round prospect. Again, remember we got him in the seventh round, five foot eleven and a half, call him six foot, two hundred and five pounds, ran a four five four. He is twenty three and a half years old. As like everybody else, he pretty much dominated high school football. Played on defense, played on offense, and also was a uh, pretty solid special teamer. He had two punt returns for a touchdown. He also lettered in track and set personal bests, blah, blah, blah. Three-star recruit, number 116 cornerback in the 2018 recruiting class. Number 215 recruit in Florida. First uh, offer he got was from South Florida. Other group of five schools like Bowling Green, Buffalo, Marshall, Tulane, and Western Kentucky soon followed. Iowa State became his only Power 5 offer, and he committed to head coach Matt Campbell in May of 2017. He was in the same recruiting class with Will McDonald and Brock Purdy. He took advantage of the extra year of eligibility granted because of the pandemic and returned to Ames. That's the point at which he switched from cornerback to safety. And then the summary says a five-year starter at Iowa State, Johnson played free safety and defensive coordinator John Heacock's 3-3-5 base scheme, lining up mostly as a nickel in the slot. After four years at cornerback, he transitioned to hybrid safety nickel role. 
as a super senior and past former Texas quarterback Colt McCoy in the record books for most career starts, 54, in Big 12 history. Johnson plays with mirroring range and man coverage and against the run and reads concepts well in zone coverage to fluidly work his area. The ball seems to find him more than he finds the ball, and he's still learning the ins and outs of being a true safety. Overall, Johnson might not have sky-high ceiling at the next level, but his character, experience, and functional size speed traits raise his floor and will keep him earning an NFL paycheck. His game and journey are reminiscent of Rams' 2019 seventh-round pick Nick Scott. Looking at Anthony Johnson in um, college, again, Iowa State Cyclones spent five years there. Very, 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 very consistent PFF grades, 73, 71, 75, 73, 73. His coverage grade, 70, 70, 75, 74, 75. Even his run defense, although not quite as consistent, still just fairly solid across the board. 82, 65, 80, 67, 68. So just call it about a 70 down the line. In his final year, 53 tackles, 9 assists, three miss, uh, excuse me, 13 missed tackles, 21 stops, 19 receptions on 29 targets for 239 yards, 2 touchdowns given up, had 2 interceptions and 2 pass breakups. Uh, as an interesting side note, those are the only 2 interceptions he's had over those 5 years. So there is a lot of optimism about Anthony Johnson, and I'm really not going to shrug my shoulders to the same degree as I usually do. Part of that just has to do with the fact that, I mean, we have an undrafted free agent as a starter right now and a first-round pick that really was one of the worst in football last year. So the idea that Anthony Johnson, even as a seventh-round pick, could step up and and potentially be one of our best starting safeties is not that crazy. The lack of experience is going to be the biggest uh, hurdle. But again, he's got five years of power five college experience playing as a DB. Now, the only possible hindrance here is, again, the fact that he's primarily been playing as a corner. Even when he made this uh, supposed switch in his final year, he still was primarily a slot guy, right? He went from boundary to like a hybrid inside the box slash slot safety. He only played 74 snaps, 76 total at free safety ever. He played 260 snaps inside the box as a strong safety, 245 snaps in the slot this last year. And honestly, that makes me kind of think back to what we talked about a little bit yesterday, which was um, Shamar Jean Charles. Because remember, he's a guy that's kind of fighting for his job as a slot guy. And I don't know that having Anthony Johnson there doesn't help give them some further confidence to move on from Shamar Jean Charles. Because remember, Anthony Johnson is probably not going to be a starting safety. With Savage, Ford, Moore, and Owens in front of him, I don't know that there's going to be enough injuries or opportunities for him to move up into that role. But could he slot in day one as our number two slot guy behind Keyshawn Nixon taking Shamar Shamar Jean Charles's job? I think it's possible. They may not start that way. They're going to leave him at safety. They like him at safety. They're going to see what he can do. But what would he be best at today? Probably playing corner slash slot corner. But anyways, that leaves us with only one guy left, and that is Benny Sapp III. He is our undrafted free agent at the safety position. Six foot one, two 205, played two years at Minnesota, although he didn't get many opportunities. So he transferred to Northern Iowa. He ended up being a starter there for three years and did quite well. 73, 73, and 70 were his three overall PFF grades. Same thing with coverage, pretty solid across the board with the uh, low 70s. Final year, uh, 20 targets, 12 receptions, 256 yards given up. He gave up three touchdowns but had four interceptions and a pass breakup, 104.2 passer rating when targeted. Benny Sapp was Dane Brugler's number 72 safety. Had him down at 5'11", 200 pounds, running a 4'6'2". And here is what Tony Pauline had to say about him. Nice size, safety with an, ag- uh, an aggressive attitude, plays heads-up football, quickly plays up coverage assignments, and tracks the pass in the air. Quick, keeps the action in front of him, and has a closing burst to the action. Works well with corners to bracket receivers out to the flanks. Fires up the field and gives effort defending the run. Weaknesses, does more hitting than wrapping up tackling. I'm not mad at it. I will be, but I'm not. Lacks next level speed and doesn't come with much of an upside. 
Sapp is a physical safety with next level size who could make a roster if he plays well on special teams. Interesting, because that's, you know, most undrafted free agents. As far as the special teams grades in college, by the way, he did grade out fairly well, 454 total snaps in special teams, mostly kick coverage and punt return. But at Northern Iowa, his grades were 77, 63, and 72 on special teams. So obviously that is his path, and um, although very unlikely that he ends up making the team or at least having a prominent role in it, again, safety's kind of weird. We'll see how it pans out. But anyways, just looking back real quick over the safety position during Brian Gutekunst's tenure here. Last year, we had four safeties on the roster. And again, these numbers change. I'm just talking about the initial 53. In 2021, we had four safeties. In 2020, we had five. In 2019, it looks like we had three. It was just Amos Savage and Will Redmond. And then in 2018, we had five safeties. So uh, three, four, four, five, five is kind of... Th- it's, it's not going to be three. So we're talking either four or five. Now, crazy things can happen, but I am going to safely assume for now Darnell Savage is on the team, Rudy Ford is on the team. I don't know 100,000% that Jonathan Owens and Tavarius Moore will both be the guy, but it is an interesting situation because when you look at it, if you say you have four spots, who in the world do you get rid of? You keep Savage, you keep Ford, you keep Moore, you keep Owens, that's four. Well, are you getting rid of Dallin Levitt? No. Are you getting rid of Anthony Johnson? No. Okay, well, that's six. got to get rid of somebody. Now, you can move Johnson to corner, maybe. You could possibly take him and just move him over to Shamar's spot and call it a day. But even then, what about Dallin Levitt? This, by the way, is, again, why I said Tariq Carpenter got moved to linebacker, because he was never going to survive over here at safety. So with that, it, it, I can't help but feel like Tavarius Moore and Jonathan Owens are not both going to be on the team. And if I had to pick one right now, it would be Tarverius Moore. Meaning you'd have Savage, you'd have Ford, you'd have Moore, and then maybe Anthony Johnson and Dallin Levitt would be five, leaving out Innis Gaines, Benny Sapp, and Jonathan Owens. Again, you could also do five and then move Anthony Johnson down. That would still be five, but um, something's getting cut down here at safety. And we will let the training camp kind of roll through and see how that all pans out. But for now, it's it's massively overstocked. But anyways, I'm going to leave it at that. You guys have a good rest of your day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.